Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Ford and I am the alumni coordinator for the College of Natural Science. Today you will hear from Dean Phil Duxbury and Dr. Amber Benton on the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion in the College of Natural Science. Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Phil Duxbury, as Sarah said, and Dean of the College of Natural Science. Thank you for joining us. I will make a few opening remarks before introducing our excellent new Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Amber Benton, who will present her vision and plans for the college. The college is committed to creating a supportive and welcoming environment where all students, faculty and staff can pursue personal growth and academic and professional success. The number of STEM jobs is growing at twice the rate of other sectors of the economy, while the number of high school graduates in Michigan is reducing. We want and need to ensure that more students from the state of Michigan have the opportunity to succeed, particularly in STEM fields, which are vital for the future economies of Michigan and the US, and which are necessary for solving many of society's grand challenges. The college strategic plan is nearing completion and builds on existing strengths while developing new opportunities in a student-focused academic environment characterized by low barriers and a historic willingness to collaborate and cooperate in education, research, and service. It is our hope that this plan will spark the vision, insight, and innovation necessary to successfully address current and future challenges and to excel in this rapidly changing world. That's our strategic priority number one is to grow and support a welcoming, diverse, NatSci community that empowers the best outcomes for all, regardless of role, identity, or ability status, by pursuing the following goals. Build a community where people feel they have a voice, a sense of belonging, and a desire to stay. Develop a culture that supports diversity through equity and inclusion. Go beyond the cookie cutter education to better address the needs of underrepresented groups, rural youth, first generation students, and international students. Diversity, diversify our community by emphasizing DEI and fairness in admissions, hiring, career advancement, recruitment, and retention practices. Develop and apply equitable and transparent systems of performance expectations in evaluation, rewards, and promotion decisions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amber Fenton. She is our new Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as I mentioned. Um, she joined NatSci only in April this year, and she's already making a big impact on our activities. Prior to coming to NatSci, she was the Director of Diversity Programming and Student Engagement in Michigan State University's James Madison College. Dr. Benton received her bachelor's degree in Spanish from Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, a master's degree in higher education leadership from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a doctorate in higher adult and lifelong education from the College of Education here at Michigan State University. Her dissertation research focused on black women undergraduates in computing at historically black colleges and universities. Dr. Benton is also the recipient of Michigan State University's All University Excellence in Diversity Award. <clears throat> in recognition of her many efforts and contributions to the initiatives and values of DEI and multiculturalism that Michigan State seeks to advance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amber Benton. Thank you, Dean Duxbury. I'm very excited to be with everyone this evening. And, and before we get started, I do want to provide some acknowledgments myself. Uh, personally, I would just like to give a big thank you to Dean Duxbury and Associate Dean Cheryl Sisk um, for all of their mentorship the past six months and helping me transition into my new leadership role. I also want to acknowledge Sarah Ford for putting this event together and all her hard work and dedication and making our introductory event a success. And so Sarah, uh, much gratitude to you for pulling this together on my behalf. I sincerely appreciate it. I also want to thank our NatSci faculty, staff, uh, including our chairs and directors. I also want to um, thank our NatSci students for creating such a warm welcome uh, for me. I've met with several groups already, and I hope to continue to meet with those uh, individually and in groups over the next uh, several months as we continue uh, this, this transition uh, for me. We're a large school, so um, plenty, plenty of people to meet, and hopefully soon I'll be able to meet many of you in person. 
I also would like to thank my colleagues who work very closely with me, and I want to provide them with an opportunity to also introduce themselves. And so they're here also today on your screen, Kendra and Jasanya. And so I just wanted to give them a couple of minutes to introduce themselves as a part of our DEI team. And then we will uh, go into more of our program about my, my vision for the college. So I'll turn it over to you too. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kendra Pyle. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am um, a graduate student in the um, School of Social Work, pursuing a master's degree and uh, just started this fall. And I'm also graduate assistant in um, working with Dr. Benton and with Jasanya Lee. And um, previously, I was working in the college um, for the last eight years as an advisor in the College of um, in the College of Natural Science in biochemistry and in plant biology, and also was assisting with diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, and we're very excited to um, be working with Dr. Benton. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasanya Lee. I use she, her pronouns. I am the DEI assistant for the College of Natural Science. I was also an alum of MSU. And I was fortunate to be a Charles Drew Science Scholar during my undergrad here. Um, NatSci definitely feels like home, and I am very excited to be helping in this capacity and um, assisting the DEI efforts for the college. Well, thanks, Kendra. Thanks, Jasanya. Um, they also help keep me, keep me, keep me on my toes and make sure that that we stay, stay organized in our efforts. So thanks for joining tonight. So now I'm going to transition um, into my presentation for you all um, on the screen here. And so tonight, um, many of you, this title may be familiar to some of you within the college, but we'll be expanding on this. But tonight, uh, the title of my presentation is called Investing in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Success of Our College. And before um, I get too started into our program tonight, I do want to offer a land acknowledgement. And so we do provide the land acknowledgement before formal programs as an offering, but I also want to um, uh, uh, also share that we must follow it up with action. And so in my time here in NATSA, I'm hoping that uh, we can collaborate and partner on how we can better serve our Native and Indigenous community as well. But the land acknowledgement reads here uh, as follows. Uh, we collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fire Confederacy of Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw, we recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for in indigenous inv individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who are forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So uh, my plan for today uh, is really to just give a deeper dive into my in, uh, who I am as a professional and more of my background, talk with you a little bit more about what diversity, equity, inclusion means, means to me and how that guides my work. I will talk about current efforts that were already in existence uh, before my time here in the college. And then we'll go further into my vision for the college, uh, which includes the observations, opportunities for growth uh, and priorities. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, so feel free to use the Q&A feature um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation and we will, we will take those questions at the end. So um, as for my introduction, uh, Dean Duxbury did provide you, uh, I think with a pretty robust introduction. But one thing I do wanna point out is people always ask me, what do you like to be called? And to be honest, I do prefer to be called Dr. Amber Benton. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, part of the reason why I like being called Dr. Amber Benton is for the statistic that's on your screen here, which is in 2020, um, only a little over 1500 black female, uh, 
there were only a little over 1,500 Black female doctoral recipients uh, out of a total of 25,000. And so there is a small number of us um, who are receiving doctoral degrees in the United States. And so it's very important because many people do not look like me uh, who have doctoral doctoral degrees. And so having a PhD is something that is very special. And so having an honorific in front of my name um, is important. And I do ask that people are respect the honorific that's in front of my name. Uh, so a little bit more about me. So you know my title, um, I've told you my name, my pronouns, but also things about me is that I'm from Las Vegas. That is my hometown. I grew up on the West for most of my life. And that's really where my passion for DEI started. Las Vegas is a very urban community. I used to work in Parks and Rec, uh, not like the TV shows, nothing nothing like that. But I, were, I had the opportunity to work with lots of children uh, who had disabilities, who were in foster care, who had parents who were incarcerated. Uh, and I was responsible for youth programs. And at the time, we didn't call it DEI work. I didn't even know that that's what you would call it. Um, but as I look back on it, that's really where my trajectory began. Uh, with that, I was a first-generation college student, first in my family. Uh, I went to Pacific, as you as you know, and I received. I came back home and received my master's in educational leadership from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And then I moved all the way from Las Vegas here to Michigan and started my tenure here with the institution. And during that time, I, I received my PhD um, in higher adult and lifelong education. I've been in MSU for almost eight years at this point, and I have been in uh, now three colleges. So I started with College of Engineering, then James Madison, and now here in the College of Natural Science. And a mantra I like to share with folks uh, that I like to use for my DEI trainings is nothing will work unless you do. And so I always remind people that no matter, no matter what information I share around DEI, it is not possible to see that through fruition if we all do not work together. And I'll be explaining a little bit more about that later. Um, but here's a little bit more about my professional background. Uh, I won't go into all, all the details because some of this has been shared with you uh, before, but I started my career here as an academic advisor and moved into a director position and now serving as assistant dean. During my time here, I did create MSU Social Justice Art Festival. We are in our fifth year. That program has been sustained over time. It is a university-wide uh, event, and you're welcome to check that out more if you go to socialjusticeartfestival.com. I also created the Women of Color Community, which is a professional uh, networking space for women of color here at MSU. And we also provide an annual conference for folks who identify with the, with the community. I used to serve on MSU's Institutional Diversity Excellence and Action Coordinator uh, Coordinators Committee core team, which is their leadership. Uh, and so I served on that for several years. I also was a part of the Council of Racial and Ethnic Minorities, serving in a short stint as vice president of the Black Faculty, Staff, and Administrators Association. I am also a trained intergroup dialogue facilitator. So many of trainings that I do incorporate intergroup dialogue techniques um, and, and, and skills. And then also I was a all University Excellence and Diversity Award recipient. And the last thing is I recently served on President Stanley's Racial Equity Task Force. Uh, and while there are other professional um, experiences that, that I could share, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But part of, part of what some of you may be wanting to know is how does any of this relate to STEM and science? And I do have a background um, in STEM education uh, through my time the beginning of my time at the College of Engineering. And so I did do an NCWIT Summit flash talk, similar to a TED talk about increasing women's participation in computer science. I've done a few pilot studies about perceptions of success, uh, particularly amongst underrepresented students in STEM and specifically in computer science. I was a part of a NSF project examining cross-sector organizational efforts to diversify STEM. And we did, um, from that, we did create a peer-reviewed journal article as well about that project. 
And then my dissertation was, I am doing more than coding, a qualitative study of Black women HBCU undergraduate persistence in computing. And so um, much of my work and interest uh, is related to STEM and, and still is. And so very happy that I am a part of the College of Natural Science. So with that, we'll move on uh, to, to the things that people are probably more curious about, which is the DEI part. And before I begin with the vision, I think it's important we're on the same page about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means, or at least what it means through my lens. And so I always like to start with D, which is diversity is the fact of difference. Uh, you automatically have diversity. If we all were to gather in a room, we are all going to be different. We have different personalities, different races, different genders, different experiences, different social classes, et cetera. Um, but if you look at uh, research uh, and practice regarding diversity, it will let you know that diversity by itself does not yield more positive outcomes for groups and organizations. You have to do something in addition to that. Uh, and like Ferdman says, simply representing a greater variety of differences in an organization or group is not a magical path toward greater performance. And so D, the D part alone is not enough. Uh, but many of us, if we're thinking about diversity or curious what diversity uh, might mean to me. It means a lot of things. So here on your screen, you see race, ethnicity, gender, ability, sexuality, age, and many of us would consider those core dimensions. But diversity is also all of these things as well. So things like your income, your religion, your education background, uh, your first language or multiple languages you might speak, your family status, where you live, how you communicate, your work style, your role in an organization, et cetera. And so all of these things, many of us have different identities around uh, these circles you might see here on your screen. But again, like I said, the D part is not enough. So we must look at the other two factors, which is equity. And so equity is, in a nutshell, equal access to opportunity. And if we think about this in an education standpoint, it is understanding students' needs and addressing those needs by providing the necessary academic and social support services to help level the playing field so students can achieve their goals. Um, but how is that different from equality? Some might say, why isn't equality the goal here? We should be focusing on that. Uh, there are differences between equality and equity. So equality is the state of being equal. Um, it means that we have the same rights, social status, et cetera. And if you look at the picture here, if everything were equal, um, is everybody able to see the baseball game? And the short answer is no, because they are different people. You know, one is shorter, um, one is significantly taller. And so this is how our society is. We all come from different backgrounds, which affords us different opportunities. And so because of that, we have to focus on equity, which is fairness or justice and the way people are treated. And this could be on an individual or a systemic level. And then that brings us to the I part, which is inclusion. And so in order to have inclusion, uh, we have to think about how not just including everyone, but how people are feel, how do they feel in terms of being a part of an organization? And so you see here that inclusion is what we do with diversity when we value and appreciate people um, because of and not in spite of their differences. Uh, the experience of inclusion is facilitated and made possible by behavior of those in contact with the individual, uh, by the individual's own attitudes and behavior, by values, norms, practices, et cetera. Uh, but in order to measure inclusion, it's really it really should be based on whether or not those affected by a practice or behavior feel that they are included. And so if we look here on the screen, you see that there is a systems of inclusion. And so inclusion can happen on multiple levels. So your society, your organization, our leaders, our groups and teams, which may be in our departments uh, and programs, and then us as individuals and how we are experiencing things as individuals. But how would we determine if we're being inclusive or not? And uh, and so you see here on the left, it says inclusion needs to be conceptualized in terms of people's perceptions and interpretations. A uh, set of objective facts cannot necessarily determine whether inclusion exists. So you may want to think about if you send everyone an email, just because everybody got the email does not mean that they are necessarily uh, included. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean that you have um, reached the ideals of inclusion just by checking off everyone on the list. 
So with that, that is how I how I perceive DEI. And so with that, I do want to talk about some existing efforts because much of the work that is being done happened long before I came here. And I do want to give recognition to what is currently going on in the college. So right now in the college, we do have a college level diversity, equity and inclusion advisory committee or what we call DEAC. There's also department and program level DEI committees within NATSI as well. We have the cultural competence competency workshop, and that's offered every semester, and that is led by Kendra. But we're also a dynamic college. There's much activity, much diversity in science disciplines and research and teaching going on in the college as well, which makes it exciting uh, and offers lots of different opportunities for engagement. But we also offer significant service courses, which can be a benefit to all of our students needing to graduate, but it does pose some challenges, which uh, I'll touch on later in my presentation. We also have, because we are large, our communication um, is decentralized and decentralized does not mean ineffective. So I want to be clear about that. Decentralized just means that we have large departments who have their own ways of communicating um, and sharing information. Also, observations are the need for DEI skill sets. And so some of this has been requested and some of this has been asked for by students um, as well as different groups, but people are actually really interested in developing their skills, which is exciting. And that's not just about training. That's also things like conflict resolution, providing appropriate feedback, making sure we're using the right language. And so there is a high engagement there. Other observation I've made is our student engagement with our undergraduate student population, particularly between their first and second year. While our population is large, um, the resources we have to fully engage with students is limited which is goes with the next point, which is limited resources for co-curricular engagement. Uh, best practices are that students have enriching co-curricular experiences. And when there's limited resources for those, it does impact students who are often on the margins uh, in terms of creating persistence and graduation rates that are comparable to their peers. And then the last is decentralized out, outreach efforts. So while we do have robust outreach activity, um, there, there does seem to be a great opportunity to bring outreach efforts together under a DEI mission. Uh, and so some opportunities for growth and areas where I will mostly be spending my time are inclusive language practices and behaviors. So many of this is going on, but how can we have shared understanding around these items here? Also strategic recruiting. So there is some recruiting that goes on within our department and programs. But again, if we're thinking about DEI and thinking about goals around DEI, there has to be a strategy that speaks to um, our values around DEI and where the college wants to go. Uh, similar to recruiting for students, if we think about employees, we also um, have an opportunity to have more of an active recruiting strategy across the college. So how can we deeply engage people long term in hopes of diversifying our workforce? We're going to need that active recruiting if we want to get a diverse instructional workforce. And when I say instructional workforce, I'm referring not just to our tenure stream faculty. I'm thinking about everyone who is going to be in front of a student in a classroom. So that includes our specialists and includes our instructors as well. We also um, have an opportunity to diversify leadership, specifically with our chairs in the college, but also thinking about dean's office leadership, directors of programs, um, and other opportunities that might allow different groups of people to have leadership positions. And then our race and gender diversity of our undergrad and grad student population. Much of this is due to pathways, which I will talk about, um, but that is also in need of diversifying as well. Uh, and a big part of where I will spend my time is our college climate. And part of this is making sure that we have a sense of belonging for our NATSI members, including students, faculty, staff, postdocs, specialists, uh, and other members of our community. And then partnering with our um, academic and student affairs leaders and colleagues around our undergraduate graduation rate. There is an opportunity gap uh, between Latinx, Native and Indigenous students, and Black students uh, in the college. And we want to make sure that they are able to reach parity with their peers and graduate in a timely manner. 
And then the last, there is also an opportunity to increase staffing. So much of the things that need to be done under the umbrella of DEI will likely um, need staffing. So with that, uh, what have we been up to these past six months? And so there's quite a few things going, uh, going on and have gone on uh, that I'm really happy to share with you all. And part of this uh, is here on the screen. There's a few more I will also share, but have worked on enhancing our faculty and academic staff search process. So DEI is fully embedded into all aspects of that search process from how we recruit to to the job ad, to even how we conduct the search. Um, so that is an ongoing effort. Um, I also want to thank again, Associate Dean Cheryl Sisk and Heidi Purdy uh, for collaborating with me and being thought partners around enhancing search processes. Part of that is due to the active recruiting strategies. That is a more recent development of really engaging and sometimes challenging uh, uh, searches to really think about how can we actively recruit for the positions in order to ensure our best chances of diversifying, again, our workforce in the college. Also, I created a DI communication response plan. So when issues may arise, how can we respond timely? I also created a college uh, reporting process, so providing college contacts if there are concerns around what happens uh, in the college, whether it's something that may affect a student, uh, affect a staff member, and even down to what the issue might be. So is it discrimination? Is it academic misconduct, et cetera? And that was a collaboration with our dean's office leadership. We also um, implemented a climate initiative, so asking departments to submit their climate goals. That is ongoing. So this month, we are hoping to gather data around uh, different departments' climate goals that they will work on for the next two academic years. And then I also engaged in graduate teaching assistant and undergraduate learning assistant orientation, so providing them a DEI orientation before they begin uh, their positions for this academic year, and many of our departments and programs uh, participated in that orientation. And then we also implemented GTA, which is Graduate Teaching Assistant Inclusive Teaching Workshops. Those have been happening every week, and we are actually almost at the end of those. And so those provide uh, different types of workshops around different DEI topics that may help our GTAs uh, become more successful in the classroom and also provide them with an opportunity to have a dialogue around some issues that they may be experiencing within the classroom. We also started Foundational Fridays, which is an overview of DEI topics. They're very narrow focus, and we do those about every other Friday for faculty and staff in the college uh, where we can gather and learn about a particular topic. We also started the Amplify NatSci series, which acknowledges different voices in the NatSci community. Last month, we celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month under this series, and our upcoming uh, event will be in November, and that is celebrating Native and Indigenous um, people in the science community. We also will be doing some student listening sessions to better understand what students' needs are, not a, simply around diversity, equity, inclusion, but just in general. We are still in a pandemic. Many of our students are experiencing different challenges. And so we want to know at this point, what, what do they need from us and how can we best use this information to strategize going forward? And then we also created the name for our office. So we are now the NatSci Center for Community Inclusion and Belonging. So we are not a DEI office, we are a NatSci Center for Community Inclusion and Belonging. Uh, and with that, you already met uh, my colleagues here, but they're also here on your screen. So it is the three, three of us who are in this center, and we're very excited to eventually get our webpage up and, and share all the services and events that we plan to provide for the college. So with that, I'm going to... Uh, and here this latter half discussing my vision for DEI um, with all of you. 
And so before I begin with my vision, I do think it's important to talk about my philosophical approach um, so that you have a better understanding of the vision I'm going to be sharing with you. But for me, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which includes access accessibility, should be embedded in every facet of our college. Uh, we should be working together to create a sense of belonging for our students, our postdoctoral scholars and researchers, faculty, staff, um, and particularly those who identify with underrepresented and marginalized communities. Within STEM, those communities would be women, which includes women of color. It includes Latinx, Black, Native, American and indigenous communities. But even though those folks are underrepresented, we should all work together regardless of identity to make sure that people feel like they belong and that their contributions are valued. We also um, want to work well, at least my philosophy is that we should work to create sustainable change by examining and adjusting current systems and structures to provide equitable opportunities and outcomes. And then these three items can be achieved through continuous learning, collaboration, dialogue, and restorative justice practices. So here is my vision. It's pretty straightforward. I will share briefly about each one of these, but there's seven parts, which is belong, recruit, retain, invest, cultivate, responsibility, and communion. And so the first one, which I just shared uh, in the last couple of slides, which is making sure we have that sense of belonging. So again, it's not enough to just make sure every everyone is in, included and just checking off boxes. We really want to make sure that people feel um, that they are valued here. Um, and we want to have what um, the uh, Association of American Colleges and Universities calls engaged inclusivity. Um, and that is transforming dialogue on inclusion from general acceptance and tolerance of difference to active institutional transformation based on the belief that the richness of our culture is because of our diversity and a recognition of our common humanity. And so switching from uh, looking at uh, a culture fit to more of what is added, what is an added benefit to our organization. So some items that would fall under creating that sense of belonging are things that are ongoing, like examining departmental cultures. Um, many of our cultures are, are entrenched across the college and they do affect how, even from how we conduct searches to voting rights, to um, opportunities to lead and get acknowledged and recognized. And so that's an ongoing effort. Um, but we also very simply can make sure program and events are accessible. We we can work together to create a welcoming environment for our students that includes undergrads and grads and also thinking about how we onboard. This is one that's already in, in the works, but making sure that when we hire people that they have a pretty solid onboarding process into the college. And another action item can be engaging our alumni of color, particularly alumni who have intersecting identities and making sure that we engage with them. And they also have opportunities to engage with the college. So our faculty and students um, around the work that they may be doing as well. Um, the next part of that, uh, that vision was about recruiting. And there's few, simple questions that I always think about when we think about recruiting. And that's whether you're thinking about recruiting for a job or recruiting students, um, et cetera. But we always have to think about what do we have to offer them? So as much as they wanna be a part of us, we have to think about what we can offer them. And then once they're here, we have to think about how can they gain access find affirmation and see affinity. And so part of that also ties into the belonging part of the vision. Um, but in order to do that, we have to engage in finding and attracting racially and gender diverse colleagues and students. Um, and we also have to understand that a diverse workforce and student population increases the vigor of our college. It actually helps us become better. Um, but recruitment for me always begins with who is underrepresented. When we think about STEM, we naturally attract men. In particular, we naturally attract Asian and white men for many reasons that I don't have as much time to go over here in this presentation with you all today. Uh, and so recruitment is really those who are underrepresented, uh, which are Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and women, as I mentioned before. 
Action items around that are things I've shared before are like having solid recruitment strategies, keeping those inclusive and equity minded recruitment goals in mind. Um, at, and also increasing STEM pathways. This is a long-term action item because of resources, but we do need to think about how can we engage students before they actually get admitted to MSU? How can we engage them in all the wonderful different types of science that we offer in our college? Also, we should think about a doctoral program, uh, particularly to create pipelines into the professoriate for underrepresented groups. And then last, active recruiting and employee searches. So we are already starting with our affirmative action sessions, which include implicit bias training, but we also have to think about our mindset around that, which is making sure that when we do these, we're not just doing it so we can hire somebody based on their race, but really recognizing the skill that they bring in addition um, to how their identity and their background may add to the culture here in that side. But we also have to provide some, some adequate support for our affirmative action advocates, which we have robustly changed in the last six months, but want to continue to support folks who might be serving in the affirmative action advocate role on search committees. The next part of my vision is to retain and it's pretty straightforward. We wanna retain people that we have here. So if we're bringing in folks to add to the diversity and to create this um, newfound culture in the college, we wanna make sure that they stay. Uh, but we also have to think about a specifically racial equity within that as well. And action items around retention, um, and while it may seem as recruitment, it also ties to retention are those pipeline programs, pre-college programs, end up uh, yielding undergraduate students and they're more likely to be retained. Uh, similarly, having undergraduate programs like RISE, Drew Scholars, Dow um, are likely to help students stay retained at the institution. And those students are often more likely to explore graduate programs and become graduate students. And again, if we had graduate students, we're more likely to have them as faculty. And if we have postdocs, we are more likely to increase our faculty. And so many of the recruitment and retention items go hand in hand. We also can explore high impact practices. Many of these are going on in the college as well. But again, thinking about those who are at the margins, thinking about those who are underrepresented, and how can we get them into undergraduate research, education abroad, co-curricular activities? What would it take to diversify folks engaging in those activities? We also, and particularly this is for myself, I really wanna work with the leaders about improving the retention rate of our undergraduate students, again, between the first and second year. And then the last one is on faculty retention. And so being aware of faculty retention and needs that faculty may, may express um, in the event that faculty may, may depart from the college. So the next part of this vision is to invest. And so I do want to share um, uh, ways we can invest. And this isn't just financially, this is thinking really broadly about how we invest in ourselves and in the college in terms of supporting our growth around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it doesn't just take financial resources. We also have to think about our time and energy and how we create that time and energy to devote to these things. And how we can invest is simply around support. So there are many people in the college who want to engage in DEI, and we want to make sure that we provide adequate support for them and their role. And that could be things from inclusive classroom support, support for their curriculum. Um, uh, and that's also thinking about our staff, our academic advisors and staff, how can we sub better support them so they can engage in more inclusive um, and equitable practices with the students they're working with. And then professional development opportunities and funding. So creating this culture around continuous learning uh, in the college that taking one DI workshop is nice, but we have to continually examine what we're doing and how can we, we be better to support the diversity of all of the people who are in our, in our organization. 
Other items or other ways we can look at investing is thinking about supporting our undergraduate students, uh, particularly around uh, mentorship. We can think about having research experiences and exposure to undergraduate research experiences. More often than not, students of color do not get exposure to undergraduate research experiences early on, as an example. So that's one thing we want to think about is how can we better support that to happen? Uh, supports for graduate students as well. So our graduate students need similar support to our undergraduate students, and we want to help them uh, adjust to the dynamic nature of uh, the science workforce that's ever changing. And we want to make sure that we optimize the types of experiences they have while they're in our graduate programs. And then last ways to invest are probably very obvious ones is um, having DEI related development and fundraising goals, uh, which are currently a part of our, our strategic plan and there are opportunities in the works um, for this as we speak. The next part of this vision is cultivating. And so cultivating is really uh, focused on fostering, developing, acquiring, promoting, and improving our cultural competency and equity-mindedness skills. And it's also about providing educational opportunities. And so while invest is what we can sort of put out uh, for people to participate in, cultivating is really where do those things come from? And so if we want people to learn, we also have to provide um, spaces for them to learn. And so again, we have our cultural competency training, which is great, but we also wanna think about supplemental DEI workshops. And many of the things that I've learned over the past few months from our faculty and staff are um, better support around the classroom, around various issues, um, better support in uh, helping survivors of sexual assault uh, is one, is one a specific example, um, but there are many things that people want to engage in. And so those are things that I, I will be um, listening to and hoping to implement in the future. But we also have many partnerships for learning. So while we are the College of Natural Science, there is much STEM activity across MSU and many units on campus who are um, interested in engaging and partnering with us from our College of Education colleagues, um, uh, to our associate provost for undergraduate education or APUE. Uh, and there's many more um, that are not listed there as well. Uh, but then also we wanna be able to promote scientific leadership for students from all backgrounds. So how can we um, ensure that our students have a science identity, uh, particularly those underrepresented groups? How can they see themselves as scientific leaders and how can we foster that early on in their time here with us? And so wrapping up the vision uh, here is responsibility. And so while we can think about all the positives and all the things that would be great to do, um, it ultimately comes down to having accountability, transparency, reliability, trustworthiness, um, in how we do DEI. And we have to think about this as a shift. It is a pivot uh, to think about this from required to what is expected. We also want to think about our moral and legal accountability for DEI. There are particular policies around this at MSU, which I'm happy to go into further. Um, but we also want to make sure we're demonstrating a social responsibility by acting independently when DEI issues are around. So wanting to ensure that people have the confidence to know what to do if something should happen. Some of those action items are better understanding around reporting, and I should add here responding. So while we report, there's always questions of what is to do next, and we are working on that. We also want to um, have an implementation of faculty search procedures to, uh, to identify and address implicit bias and standard search procedures. This is currently ongoing, um, and we're constantly learning new information every day. I know I am. Uh, and so our search process is, is enhancing. But also trainings are always the is the fundamental way to help ensure that responsibility. And then the last two is having that having a demonstration of DEI commitment in our annual review process. So how can we reward people who are already doing this type of work? How can we recognize that? And the annual review process is not just limited to faculty. This is limited, I'm sorry, this is inclusive of all of our employees. 
We also want to think about um, recognition and awards. And so looking at folks' DEI commitment when they are getting an award, especially college-wide and university-wide financial awards. And then the last part of the vision is uh, communion, which is for me, it's more than collaboration. This is getting at a deeper level of what can happen in our college. And so to have communion is similar to fellowship. So how can we share and exchange our intimate thoughts and feelings around DI topics and issues? So we have to foster a culture where that can happen. And part of that is participating in dialogue and having a mutuality of respect. And this is important to me because folks see the outcomes of the collective. So if many of us have this shared understanding and value this type of exchange, people will see that across our college. Um, when we have folks who are not on the, are not on the same page, they do, uh, they do have a different view of what we are doing collectively in the college. And so what an exciting opportunity would be if we all have these types of you know, exchanges or have this culture where we can share things we might struggle with around DEI or things we're challenged with, uh, I think that would be a pretty transformative for our college. So some of those um, action items are things we could actually start doing today and are doing today um, are alignment of values and action. So NATSI has four very straightforward values and many of our departments have their own values, but how do those align when we are doing uh, things in the college? So when we look at our policies, our procedures, our behaviors, do they align with those values? We could also look at strategic partnerships. So we don't have to do this work alone. We could partner with STEM colleges and units on campus, as well as our Office for Inclusion in this. Um, and I also just like to remind people that while communion is fellowship, we also have to think about now that I am here, um, we do find out that more challenges and opportunities that, that come up. And so part of creating communion um, is going to sometimes be through the lens of my position in itself. And sometimes those things deal with crisis management or strategic planning. And so many things can happen uh, through my position slash office. Uh, and so it's important to also think about that. But the goal is um, for us to not view this as just a position, but to view us having that NatSci Center for Community Inclusion uh, and belonging and having that be a space, uh, a space that we can hope folks feel comfortable uh, to engage with us in order to develop uh, those communal activities. But um, before, that was the last part of my vision, but before I finish, I do just want to um, recognize challenges because I know uh, sometimes things for DEI can seem like we have on rose-colored glasses, but there are financial and human resources. I understand that we are a large college and sometimes our resources don't always match dollar to dollar to person to person. We also um, are challenged by the percentage of undergraduates in STEM fields. So if we're not producing a diverse group of undergraduates in STEM fields, it does limit how many uh, students go into graduate programs. We also can be challenged by university support. So we are a large institution. Many people are competing for similar resources. And so that can present a challenge to our goals. There's also the COVID-19 pandemic. It, when I created this slide uh, months ago, uh, I thought we would be, be done with the pandemic by now, but it is still going on and is constantly presenting challenges as well. There's also our own fear. So doing things differently all, always poses fears. Uh, what will happen if we try something new? Uh, it's very easy to stay with what's comfortable and familiar. And then there's the willingness. And so while willingness may not be a challenge, but finding opportunities where people can willingly participate um, in DEI activities, sometimes that can be our own individual challenge. So just as a recap, my vision had those seven parts, which is belong, recruit, retain, invest, cultivate, responsibility, and communion. And so in summary, I just wanna point out that parts of this vision are actions. So you will notice many of them were action verbs, uh, but our actions have to be in alignment with DEI goals and values if we want to see change. 
And again, we have to have that willingness to execute things differently. So looking at creative approaches, innovative approaches, um, hearing each other's thoughts. So really listening to how we can make change that would benefit the greater good of NatSci. And I also think it's important to reimagine possibilities. So I shared with you a statistic about Black female doctoral recipients. I've shared with you about the limited number of undergraduates and graduate students. But that doesn't have to be what our future is. We can reimagine what STEM looks like. We can reimagine what STEM research and STEM work and STEM colleges can look like. And then last is having hope and joy. And while DEI work can be challenging and can present obstacles, I always rely on hope and joy. I enjoy the work that I do, and I always remain hopeful that we will see change. And that is what sustains me in this work. And so I always encourage folks uh, to keep that in mind as well. And so the last part is um, my contact. So I will wrap up here. Again, I'm Dr. Amber Benton. I use she, her pronouns. You're welcome to email me at natsi.dei at msu.edu. You're also welcome to follow me on LinkedIn if you would like to connect with me on social media. And so with that, um, I will stop there and we will take questions. Thank you, Amber. That was amazing. And I appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk with all of our faculty, students, and alumni and donors uh, tonight. I'm going to give people a couple of minutes here to get some questions submitted, but we do have one right now. Um, the question reads, what's your suggestion if someone does not feel like being inclusive? Um, so I guess I would uh, also... Um, I don't know if it's, uh, maybe we could get some clarity on here. I could answer this question in a couple of different ways. So, uh, there's one question of if you don't feel like being inclusive or you don't feel that you're included. So I could take that interpretation in a couple of different ways. So I'll address them both. Uh, so one is if you don't feel like being inclusive. And so, I would just challenge you to really reflect on why you wouldn't feel like being inclusive. What type of barriers are there uh, presented to you uh, that you feel like maybe that's not possible for you right now? So there's that. Um, for folks who feel like they are not feeling included, I would say um, as best as you can, if you are able to communicate what that is, uh, because really it's not your responsibility to make sure you're included. It's really those around us to make sure that people feel that they're included. And again, thinking about inclusion in terms of value uh, and thinking of being recognized, feeling like you belong. And so if there are specific parameters, especially if you're a current um, student or employee in that side, there are specific things that are not going on that um, are impacting you feeling like you're included. I would want to know, and you're welcome to, to reach out. But that, the reason why I say communicating that is helpful, because then we know where to go from there. So depending on what it is, maybe there are things that we can do better or better support um, units or programs and helping folks feel, feel more included. Thank you. Our next question reads, how does the vision compare to other colleges across campus? So um, many colleges are working on either they had a strategic plan uh, and that didn't include DEI and now they're creating a DEI strategic plan or they're in the process of creating a DEI strategic plan. So I would say there is some very, you know, there's some variation in timelines, NatSci is working on ours. So I wouldn't say everything completely lines up across colleges because of timing, but the university created their strategic plan and that has been released, that's public. You can look at that on the MSU website and a DEI is embedded in that as well as there is a separate DEI plan. And we're doing something similar like that in that side. Uh, in terms of my vision, I will say my vision's a little bit more robust <laughs> uh, than, than what you might find in other plans. But I would say the ethos of what people are, are thinking about are definitely there. Uh, we are a predominantly white institution. So many colleges are trying to work on diversifying. Some have less challenges than us because 
it could be that, you know, their discipline does produce more um, racially and gender diverse people to go into versus STEM, which can be limited when you start narrowing down disciplines. So that is very similar. Um, graduation rate is something that's very similar, partially because it's a priority of the uni university. And so that has really uh, been something that's been a priority even before our pres President Stanley. That's an ongoing priority. So that is also in, in alignment. But education, I think some of the things I talked about around um, cultivation and um, investing and having communion, those get at more of culture. And I'm not sure how many college plans go deep into that type of type of vision. Uh, more of what you'll find are, are probably things that are more quantitatively uh, easier to measure, such as numbers of faculty, numbers of students, graduation and persistent persistence rate. So I would say it's an alignment, but um, I go a little bit step further because I think it's important to include aspirations for our culture. Great, thank you. Um, next, we have a question that reads, how might we integrate DEI into strengths-based approaches to coaching and supporting students? So this is a good, a good question. <laughs> Um, I, I will, so I will say I am not an expert in student coaching. I, I consider myself a DI professional and that's my, my expertise. So I will offer thoughts, but also understand this is not an expert coaching uh, opinion, but I think, um, for me, as, as a person of color, I'm a woman of color. So I will share from my personal and professional experience. One thing I think we need to be cautious about is treating underrepresented groups as DEI, because uh, I think sometimes when we think about people of color as DEI initiatives or a DEI goal, we sort of laser focus on, I want more of them to be included, or I want these particular, you know, as opposed to thinking about how can I really reach my students and recognize their full humanity as students? Because students just want to show up and belong just like everybody else. They don't want to know that they are there because, oh, I have to be the token person in this situation. Or, oh, they probably, you know, have lowered standards for me because I'm one of a few, you know, in this major. And so that's one thing that I think we could think about in terms of coaching is how can you um, validate students and let them know that they are scientists, like they already scientists, you know, they want to study science, they're excited about that. How can you recognize them as a full, as a full person? So that's one aspect. But I think in coaching, I think part of uh, before you can really successfully coach someone, I think you have to do your own internal work. Uh, so depending on what your identity is, understanding what privileges you bring to the table when you're trying to work with students or do like strengths-based approaches. Because oftentimes when we're working in specifically in communities of color, we bring our own uh, our strengths may look different um, if you are not a person of color. Maybe how we do things are going to be very different than how you do things. So if you're not aware of your own identities, you're probably going to miss the strengths part of talking to your of talking to your students. But I do think it's important. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is how can you bring in aspects of your student's identity into conversation? So how can you really get to know your students? Because I think once you get to know your students uh, and who they are as people, I think it gives you better ideas about their strengths and how you might coach them ac academically, such as what was your motivation to study this? What is your, you know, why do you, why are you interested in this particular area? What do you want to do after, after this? Um, and letting them know about the possibilities. I think sometimes students can come in the door and feel very defeated in conversations because they don't feel like they have the same academic background, or maybe they're not coming from the same socioeconomic status, whether that is true or not, you know, that can be their perception. And so, um, so even though a student may have some challenges, even academic challenges, letting them know that there's still things, you can still be, be successful. There is still a path for you. It just may look different, but there is still something to do. And I said that was the last thing. I guess the last, last thing I will say is, again, finding ways to am amplify them. Um, when you are underrepresented, I think it is hard. Um, and I think that that is really important to keep in mind is that 
everybody wants some encouragement. So across the board, everybody wants some encouragement in STEM. And so how can you think about really validating and amplifying and uplifting uh, students and even in the face of adversity um, so that they can they can keep going? And that's really where the, the coaching mindset I never played a sport, but, um, <laughs> you know, athletes lose games. And so, but they have coaches who can help them keep going. And I think when you shift your mindset as more of somebody to help motivate um, and help amplify, I think that um, you'll start to see a little bit more of how you can incorporate DEI into those strengths-based ap approaches. That was great. Thank you. Um, next question. Is there a possibility to include alumni occasionally in your foundational Fridays? So that is a really good uh, suggestion. And I will say short answer is yes, we can. We were piloting this semester because I have a very extensive event and program planning background. You never know who's going to show up or participate in them. And so they've been pretty successful for faculty and staff. Um, I think it would be helpful and maybe Sarah and I can work on this together to know what particular topics alumni would be interested in um, around foundation. Fridays because some some of the things we discussed may not be relevant to the alumni community and so yes there is an op opportunity but in order to be more intentional be helpful to know what type of what type of topics would be of most interest to our alums yes we can absolutely work together on that um, okay next question can you expand on how to actively recruit minority candidates for NatSci faculty and students so I can, um, I'm not sure who asked the question. We have a whole document <laughs> on how to actively recruit. So if you were, if you were currently in the college and you are gonna be serving in a search community committee in the near future, you will probably see that document. But in a nutshell, um, it's really about being intentional. And so I'll just give you a really simple example. If it's a, let's say it's a woman of color who's at the, really top scholar in their field and working at an institution, an R1, we'll say, so a, a tier one institution, they are probably not looking at a job board. <laughs> They're probably not looking at you know, what we might be offering over here because they're succeeding, they're doing well in what in what they're doing. And so part of active recruiting is how would you be able to engage a candidate like that um, to apply for a position here or engage that person in their network because maybe they know other folks who might be qualified for the position. And so want to think about it. That was a faculty example, but we also want to think about that even with advising. So um, Passive recruiting would be posting things on job boards. So just posting on the job board or the MSU career site and hoping for the best. Passive, uh, more that likely than not, you're, you're probably not going to get the most diverse pool. But if you are reaching, uh, there's like the NSF, uh, there's a registry of people of color with doctoral degrees. NSF also posts data about who has doctoral degrees in a particular discipline. If you're not looking at the PhD level, I think it's even, you have an even wider net of people to recruit from, but you want to think back, who are professionals that you know? Who presented at conferences? Uh, who's in your organization? Um, who has visited? So has, have we have visiting scholars? Because somebody came, came in and gave a talk. How do you tap into those people and their networks? So sometimes it's not just them applying, but you want to tap into their network. But we also have to spend time on it. And that's the one thing about having a long-term active recruiting strategy. We got to spend time about... Uh, uh, making sure that we are making personal contact because that's what takes time. And if you just do it right when your search happens, your search could potentially be delayed with the level of personal contact. So beginning a brainstorm, personal contacts, and just having that list in departments is helpful. But if you want to do some personal outreach, send an email and say, we have this posting. We think you would be great. And we would encourage you to apply based on XYZ expertise, but you have to do some more intentional outreach. Um, just posting things on job boards is a very outdated practice. And so we have to start building capacity for um, intentionally recruiting. And, and some of that does cost money because job, some, certain associations are going to charge you to get access to particular groups of people. And so part of that is if it if there are organizations, many departments are constantly using, maybe we want to think about more of a financial strategy around uh, active recruiting as well. 
I'm going to tag this other question on because it kind of stems off of that. How do you envision recruiting more historically underrepresented students into NatSci? Um, so this is this was one of the long term <laughs> goals here. This is something that will take time. So students have to be able to get admitted to MSU. And so NatSci already has large uh, numbers of students. So we're, you know, I know people are not excited about extending quantity here, and I'm not asking for that. I, part of my vision was strategic recruiting. So not necessarily looking at increasing numbers, but how do we actually get in contact with people um, who may be able to um, add to the diversity of the college. And so there are, there are lots of ways. The most effective way is definitely having a bridge program, having some type of pre-college experience for students uh, where they can learn about NatSci. And it would really be catered to students who may be on the fence. Um, you usually want to spend your pre-college dollars on students who may be interested in students who already, already know, like, I'm going to be a plant biology major, and then I'm going to do this, do that. Probably not where you want to focus your efforts because they've already been sold. You want to, again, we're thinking about increasing the pathway. So how can we increase more students? You want to engage those who might be on the fence about what, what they want to do, but might have an interest in, in science. So that's the, the effective one. It does cost a lot. And just put it in perspective uh, for us, the size of NATSA, I mean, we could be looking at a million dollars every year on a, on a fully robust pre-college program. Uh, but there are things that the university is doing. And so there is some engagement already with our admissions office. Those efforts have already been going on. Um, but I think long-term, it coupled with the pre-college program, we, I would love to see us have a recruiter in the college who can spend time in schools where there are um, racially and gender diverse students and really talking to them. Because from my stint, I used to do a little bit of recruiting. Families of color, especially first gen students, they're not they're not getting all the science education and their K through 12 um, experience. We have so many different majors. Many students don't know what that is. And so when they come into NatSci, they're more exposed because they're here. But we want to make sure they're proactive and that they're not concentrated in the same majors, that they know all the possibilities. You can study physics and astronomy. You can study microbiology. Like it's vast. Um, it's not uh, so generic like AP biology, what they're used to in high school or life science. I mean, that's very broad. And so wanting to get uh, in contact with them early enough so they know what their options, options are. But really, it's going to come down to finances and needing re recruitment, a recruitment team and having a, a pre-college program will be able to see more significant gains in the diversity of at least our under undergraduate uh, students. Similar things can happen on the graduate um, graduate level uh, as well. Um, but there's already, uh, I would say, more robust recruiting that happens because the numbers, grad programs have less students. Uh, and so the, there's a different type of intentionality ar around that. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna make a note of the time. We have about four minutes left and I wanna be respectful of everybody's, everybody's time. So I'm going to read this question and I'm gonna tack on a little bit to it. Uh, so. Uh, this question reads, as a middle-aged white male, how can I do more? That is, I'm willing to take a back seat or a supportive role D with DEI issues, but I don't know how to move forward. So I'm just going to add on, as everybody who is attending today, what are some things that we can all do in our everyday lives, in our work, things like that, you know, like our, our take-home homework from this? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So I'll, I'll try to be quick. So I think one, I think I appreciate the question. And the thing is, I will say, don't beat yourself up about it because we all have homework. So whether you're white, maybe your goal is to learn more about people of color. You know, if you identify straight, you need to learn more about LGBT. You know, there's we all have some work to do on different identities, myself included. Uh, one thing I think a really easy one is just learning language. I think language is very powerful, how we speak about communities. So I always talk about the language use isn't amplifying. I personally don't think minority is amplifying. Um, disadvantaged is not amplifying, uh, underserved, you know, but how can we talk about like, our students are scholars, they're scientists, like, um, we are a science community, you're learners, like, 
how can we modify our language? That's one way to very easy way to get in, involved in DEI. The other one is honestly, we have to make time. I feel like that's the biggest barrier. Um, many people want to learn, but then it's like, well, I have this, or I have this, or I have this, and then it, it gets placed on the back burner. We have to make time to actually learn. Um, many of us who went to public school know, I mean, how many hours do you spend in school learning about all those subjects? And same thing applies. You have to spend some time, but I'll give you some quick thoughts. Um, Instagram, lot thistle topics, Blair Amani. If you're on Instagram, they post regularly DEI things. Um, there's also anti-racism daily, which posts things. So if you're looking for really snapshot things, I would encourage you to dive further, which they always provide links really quick way. If you feel like you don't have time, podcast. Podcasts are really, really great. And not just podcasts that are called diversity podcasts, but actually listening to journalists who may be people of color, LGBTQ people, they often talk about their experiences. So you're learning and you're not reading, you know, you're just listening. Many books are on Audible. So again, if you don't have time to read, you can listen to listen to a book. But you have to make time to actually, actually train. But I think the thing is that we all can do uh, is he, be humble, have some humility. We are constantly learning. Uh, I shared last week in one of our trainings that microaggressions are things that have evolved. I've learned more as I've gotten older. So you have to be patient with yourself um, and humble enough to know that you don't know every everything, and you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes uh, along along the way. Um, but hopefully. Um, it is learning opportunities for you and that you'll be able to want to, you know, develop further. Uh, but I know because we have limited time, but if you're in that sign, you want to learn specifically more, there's something specific you want to learn about, you're always welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to give you specific resources for the thing you're, you're looking for. But th those are my, those are my, uh, my quick tips uh, for you. Um, uh, and happy, always happy to, to share more. But those I think are really, really good starting points if you're trying to figure out um, where where should I go. And actually, I'll say one more thing: you can't change who you are. So you you can't. So don't feel bad if you have privileges, and, or and don't feel bad if you don't have a lot of it. Like you can't help who you are. The best we can all do is learn and try to be better every day. And so that's my advice. If you do one thing tonight or tomorrow morning that is going to be better, even like sharing your pronouns, friends, like that's one step better than you were, were yesterday. So there's that. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Benton. This was wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody who uh, tuned in today and who's watching this later down the road is watching the recording. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me a follow up email after that. Um, if not, uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next virtual event. Have a great night, everybody.